Hello everyone. Wonderful. I think we are live, which is brilliant news. So welcome to this evening. I will shortly be joined live by our guest. So if I seem a little distracted, it's just because I'm going to be keeping an eye out for her. So this evening's conversation is all part of the Honour Your Body series. The Honour Your Body series was put together because I recognise that as women, we go through certain experiences in our life and that we need to then work with our minds, our bodies, our, our spirits in perhaps different ways to how we would do ordinarily. So this has been a journey so far and this evening's conversation I am so, so pleased to be bringing to the airwaves to this evening over Instachat because it's something that I know many women have struggled with and there's a lot of struggle that happens in silence. So by having these conversations and making topics like this accessible, it means that women, you can get curious about things that may support you at certain times in your life. And this evening I will be joined by Helen who is from Our Healing Voice, and I've just seen that she is there, so I'm just gonna invite her on. As we're gonna be talking about, oh, let me just see, go live in a room. I'm so sorry about this. This has changed. Helen, if you're there, do you want to see if you can Invite yourself to the meeting. I've hopefully brought you in. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you beautifully. Can you hear me? I'm not, I'm, I can hear you. I'm not shouting, am I? No, no, no. You're perfect. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so let's begin. So Hi everyone, I'm Tara Palaki and welcome to this series, like I said, which is about honouring your body. And this evening's conversation is honouring your body during or, or when experiencing being childless, not by choice. And it's such an incredibly unique part of a life experience and it is a life experience. And for me, I don't witness it having this nice tidy shelf life of it starts on a Monday and then you, you kind of have a dip and then it's done by Friday. This is something that can consume every single part of a, of a woman's being. And so tonight we're gonna to start entering into conversations and Helen's going to be bringing in her incredible, amazing, unique gifts. But we may only be scratching the surface because it can be every part of a woman's experience, their very identity to a core that can be impacted by experience. So we're going to be talking about it from the angle of finding your voice. And again, Helen will come on in a moment and introduce herself because it's so important that we find our voice because in my experience, it is such a big part of what we can lose. And conversations like this are part of us reclaiming our voice and is part of bringing together a community of women who who even if our stories are different we can still appreciate and understand some of the complexities of what this unique experience is so who am I very briefly I am a kinesiologist I am a yoga teacher and a womb massage practitioner and I really work in more of the field of energy medicine and mindful movement to help create unique roadmaps and toolkits to help women calm their minds, tap into their energies and heal naturally. And tonight's discussion, like I say, is a really poignant one because it is one that's very close to my heart. Having been on a personal journey myself, which I'm sure there'll be more that unfolds, um, 
but also recognizing that I'm not alone in this. And even though so often in my journey, felt so alone, one in five women will be turning 45 and childless. And, you know, that really blew my mind when I first heard this statistic, because for me, I was thinking, my goodness, <laughs> this, is, this is a large part of society. What's brought us to this place will be different for every woman. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. For some, it, um, it's so vast. It's not just through fertility challenges. It's not just through uh, medical conditions. It's not just through certain, perhaps not meeting the right partner. It can be so vast, so varied. And so my intention this evening as I hold the space and have conversations with Helen is to to make it as open and as welcoming to everyone and to honour, welcome you into this space, whatever your story, whatever your journey so far. And I'm really, really excited to be holding this space with Helen, who I've recently come to meet uh, about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. Yeah. And we've already had some amazing conversations. <laughs> so I'm so, so honoured and so excited to speak more as you share more about who you are and what's led you to creating this incredible community. So Helen, please tell us more about who you are and what you do. Well, hello, it's really lovely to be here, Tara. Thank you so much. I have to just tell you, it's my first live, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I'm always better when I'm singing rather than when I'm talking. <clears throat> so I might have to clean my throat like that sometimes. Okay, so um, I'm part of the childless community and I have been for a very long time. Um, well, as an adult, I've been part of the community for the last eight years. I, I am a gateway woman. I'm in Gateway Women, which is a fantastic organisation um, for childless, not by choice women. Um, but going back further than that, I first really knew well I didn't know but I thought that I might be childless um, from the age of 18 so that's a really long story and when you gave me this question who are you I thought okay am I gonna go well I'm Helen I'm a singer I'm 54 and I live in London or <laughs> am I gonna go back to when I was 18 years old so um, if you don't mind I would like to do a little bit of that journey just because I it, it really has been a journey and when I think of myself now who am I that was the most difficult question that you gave me out of the three the other two I could do <laughs> but who am I I felt like like who am they you know because I feel like I've had so many lives external lives internal lives through this journey so I will start at the beginning if that's all right with everyone um, it's the first time I'm telling my story as opposed to writing it down. And I don't, I mean, no one might listen to this. Loads of people might listen to it. But um, basically I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was 18 years old. And um, there's a lot coming up about endometriosis now. In, nine, in the mid 80s, uh, there really was nothing to the point that when I was told I had it, it was something that was kind of muttered. I didn't even really pick up on it. And because they said that there was nothing that could be done, I thought, well, I don't need to, that's, that's something I don't need to think about. I don't need to remember that bit because we can't sort that bit out. So, you know, I really felt, um, I really felt very, very much alone. So yeah, it was purely by accident that I was diagnosed. I had had very heavy periods, painful periods from when I started, um, you know, when I, when I started them at 14 years old. And I'd been to the hospital quite a few times. I'd been to the doctors. Um, I'd gone on the pill. I'd been told to come off the pill as maybe you're allergic to it, you know, and all the, and, and in, that was probably the worst thing I could have done actually come off the pill because by the time I was 18, it was getting worse and worse. I was passing out. Um, and actually my boyfriend at the time, um, his aunt was a nurse and she said to me, oh, she was lovely Irish nurse. And she said to me, next time she said, you have a period, she goes, what do you want to do? You want to collect it all and put it in a Tupperware container and take it to the hospital. So I was absolutely mortified. Can you imagine telling that to a teenager? But I, I did do it and I took it to the hospital and they were horrified. They rushed me in for an emergency laparoscopy. They thought that I had, that I might have an ectopic pregnancy. Wow. 
so that's so i kind of got di i kind of got diagnosed by default if you like it was not not default by you know by circumstance um they weren't looking for that and then you know i was only 18 and in the morning i remember lying in the hospital bed in the ward in those days anything gyne gynecology was in the same room so you've got women having abortions women having hysterectomies women women in pain women don't know what they're doing women who are pregnant next door you've got the maternity ward with screaming babies and i'm lying there and this doctor finally comes to me and he says to me um he couldn't really uh, he was an old man and he said something about inconclusive and um highly unlikely you'll ever conceive and i was just in shock um and i i didn't know what to do really and good job i managed to say something so i thought if i don't ask him now i might not get chance again he might be gone forever so i just said what does that mean what does that mean i don't understand what that means and he said um it's highly unlikely that you're ever going to be conceived it's too damaged um but we couldn't really see enough so you know i was just like basically it was like the bottom dropped out of my world you know i thought my god i'm 18 years old my life hasn't even begun and now it's over that's what i thought yeah. and i'm telling this part of the story in detail because i do think it had a massive impact on my mental health for the next few years a nurse kind of looked over at me and i remember looking at her you know what it's like when you're a teenager you're like what's she thinking about me what she you know you're still a child you, you think you're an adult but the only one who thinks you're an adult is you you know everyone else looks at you as though you're a child and i remember thinking oh i bet she thinks you know i bet she thinks i've slept with loads of loads of boys and i bet she thinks this about me and i bet cuz she took she can't there's no you've got no life experience yeah. and she said to me um she said don't worry it happens to lots of women you'll get used to it wow and that was it. I know. Awful, isn't it? Awful. And then I had to pack myself up and had to go home. And I uh, told my mum. And she was just shocked but didn't know what to say. Didn't have a great relationship my, with my mother in terms of talking about things like that. And, she, and I said to her, do you think I should go back? And sit, do you think I should go and ask? What should I do? And she kind of said to me, you know, you don't want to have a baby now, do you? Because, I mean, that was, that was the kind of the worst thing that could happen to you in your teens was getting pregnant back then you know so and, I, and actually at that moment i thought to myself actually yes i do that's exactly what i want to do i want to have a baby right now right right this minute i want to have a baby i don't care what anyone else thinks about me and so that was the beginning and that was kind of setting the stage of it really but um after that i just plummeted i mean i was just in a, i was a mess for about a year i was i just felt that you know when you're a little child and you think if i cry hard enough somebody will come and save me Yes. That's how I felt. I thought if I feel enough pain and if I'm upset enough, something magical will happen and this will all go away and I will come out of this nightmare. But I didn't. Yeah. And so, you know, I decided when I got to um, 19, I thought, right, I'm going to do something about this. Mm -hmm. I went on a health kick. I lost two and a half stone. I started to go running, got super healthy, marched into the hospital and said, well, I want something done about this. I'm getting married. And um, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and so that was kind of the, that was my start really into looking at maybe what I could do. And that was my start of hope. Yeah. And um, in those days, if you weren't married, why were you doing anything at all? You should be, you shouldn't be thinking about having a baby. You're not even married. Come back when you're married. And I thought, no. So yeah, I wasn't, it wasn't meaning to get married, but I thought if I tell them I do, put engagement ring on and everything. Yeah. Had tests over about a three year period. And eventually um, I did get married. Um, and I had, um, I've made enough fuss that basically they decided that they would do a major operation for me and remove as much of the endo as they could. So they cut me from there to there and they did all of that. And I'm glad actually that I pushed for that now. I'm really glad that I pushed. It didn't, it didn't change the diagnosis because the tops of my tubes are fused together with adhesions. So the eggs can't go in right. okay. to the fallopian tubes. Yeah. Um, and so, um, but I'm still glad that I had that done, you know, and that was, that was kind of in the very early 90s. So, yeah. And it just went on from there, on from there. And I kind of, I was married to a guy at the time who had a child. So I had a stepson. So in a way, the focus kind of wasn't on me. The focus was on the child. Um, and then 
I just kept thinking, I don't think he really believed it. I think he just thought, oh, it'll, it'll happen. It'll happen. And I was kind of quite scared about it. They put me on Clomid as well, which was a drug that I took for three years. You're only supposed to have it for four, six months. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I really just concentrated on getting on with my life. I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to get on. And people would say, oh, but you're young. You've got loads of time. Don't worry, you've got loads of time. And um, really... Um, so I'm just getting, I can't think about it too much because otherwise I'll start getting too involved. Um, but yeah, I thought, well, I'll just do any, I'll do a job that earns me money. I'll just do the housework. I'll just do my shopping. I'll just go through the motions because all I was thinking about, this was like the main movie going on in my head that nobody knew about. I was the only person in the cinema watching it. Mm. And then um, eventually I started singing. And that was really because my marriage was breaking up and I wanted to do something for myself. Yeah. Um, and so a friend of mine, we used to go to karaoke. She was my best friend. She's actually, she's since died, but we had a great time. We used to go out, you know, girls together. And she was, a, she was a good singer as well. And, she, and we went home one night we were drunk and we were singing on karaoke. And she said, I didn't know you could sing like that. <laughs> Because I did used to sing a little bit. And um, she said, why don't, you, why don't you do something with that? Mm. And I was like, oh, I don't know. What am I, what am I, what am I going to do? She goes, do it for yourself, Helen. Just, just, just do, what? do something for yourself. Do it for yourself. And so I did. And so, you know, I, 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 I found a singing teacher. She was a fantastic woman. And, um, yeah, I started, doing, I started having singing lessons. Yeah. And from there, my world changed. So there you go. It was kind of a... I will speak more about that in a minute, but yeah, that was kind of the lead up. But that was a long 10 years, Tara. That was 10 years of my life, you know. It was a long time. And um, I didn't know. I didn't know how to, I didn't know what to do. There was nobody. There was no organisations back then. I think people think now, because there's a lot going on. There was nothing. And there was no one I could tell. The only person that really knew was my best friend. Yeah. And... She had two children, and I was, I'm godmother. To, she had three children, actually, but I'm godmother to two of her children. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it was, when I was young, it was, I was just scared. Most of the time, I remember just being scared all the time, but not being allowed to tell anyone or not showing anyone that I was scared because I thought, oh, I don't want them to think I'm losing my mind. Then they won't give me any treatment. Yeah. I can just really hear how much you were carrying and like you say there being nobody we're really lucky that we have social media nowadays and I think you know that plays such a big part in connection doesn't it in ways that that just weren't available and if your community if people in your community didn't have children and for you know for these reasons who do you go to like who no one there was no reassurance of just even what you're feeling is totally normal and i know that that's something that you know personally when i've um like when i read jody Do day's book mm. i her words i thought oh somebody else has been there i now have these words that are being able to formulate the feelings that i've got the thought processes that i have but I didn't even realize I was having them until they were in black and white and I could go, oh, I'm not alone. Somebody else has had them because they've been able to write them. And so yeah. my heart really goes out to you for going on that journey by yourself. And mm. To be in that place, I can fully appreciate, I hadn't heard the word scared before in this journey, but I can really witness how that would have been such a powerful sensation to be carrying around and by yourself. Yeah, I was terrified. I was terrified and I thought it's me against the world. And I really felt that like was fighting every step of the way, you know, and I didn't know that there, there was an end in sight. You know, the Cinderella in me, let's face it, you know, the fairy princess in me that we've been indoctrinated by still thought, yes, something will happen. But, you know, I knew that the odds were heavily stacked against me. You know, I have to tell you, actually, um, my marriage ended, um, and then after that, I actually got pregnant naturally. Wow. Now, this was like 15 years after I'd had this diagnosis. Yeah. 
Um, and I was it completely, I, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a, a medical term for this, but it definitely bleep, bleep, bleeps my head. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, you know, um, I couldn't get my head around it. And I felt like I was just inside of myself for that whole three months. And I miscarried. And I have to tell you that when I happened, even though it was terrible at the time, it was kind of like, I was kind of, woohoo. It was like, I was just going with that flow. And then I thought, okay, it, but it happened. Maybe it can happen again, yeah. you know? And that gave me, a, in a way, gave me a, kind of a false sense of security. So, like, I never did IVF or anything because my marriage was breaking down. And then I was single for three or four years. And then I had this, um, you know, I had this uh, pregnancy with someone who I wasn't with. And then I, you know, so people are like, but you had all this time. Why don't you do this? I was, I, uh, another story, seeing as we're talking about childlessness, and I just want to tell it, I've got so much that I can talk about. But in my 20s, um, we looked at IVF. I was told by the NHS that they wouldn't let me have IVF because we already had a child in our life. So that was, wow. in the 90s, they said, no, you, you're not eligible for it because you have a stepson. Yeah. And then about two years later, I received a letter from a private clinic in London. This was like in the 90s when, I, I'm not going to name the clinic actually, because God knows now what can happen if you say anything. But it was a private, very well-known private clinic that was setting up. And they actually offered me one free round of IVF in return for as many of my healthy eggs as they could take. And the deal was that I would get this one round. And if it didn't work, that was it. But I would have no right to know what happened to any of, of my eggs. And I was told in the letter that you are probably one of the best people to understand what other women are going through here. And, you know, we'd be very, very grateful if you could do this. So, it was, yeah, that was fun. So lots of things happened, you know, lots of things, lots of avenues. I thought about maxing out six credit cards, thought about, you know, we were going through a, a problem uh, as well, like with property. There was a property collapse in the 90s. Yeah. No one could sell because, you know, everyone's property was worth less than what they pay for it. All these kind of things came into play. So, um, yeah, kind of like at, the, at that time, really, when I had my most fertile years, the situation really wasn't right. And so after I had this uh, miscarriage at 33, um, really, I was kind of like heading towards the bit where, oh, hang on a minute, if you don't do it in the next two or three years, you're going down that slope. Yeah. You know. And um, but yeah, but then I, I started singing and singing actually um gave me myself back in a format that i could understand um i wasn't confused i was no longer scared and it really really grounded me um and uh, do you want me to talk a bit about that well what i'd love to know is had you had any singing training before or was it more karaoke down the pub with your best yeah yeah, it was karaoke down the pub. I sang in the choir when I was a kid. Right. My parents were in Amdram. My father was, was Northwest London's leading Amdram in the 80s. But I was never in that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I mean, I sang as much as anyone else sings, you know. And I, but I was musical. I played, I played instruments at school. I danced a lot as a child. Ah, right. I was more into, yeah, I wanted to be a dancer, actually. Yeah. I didn't get, I was too short. <laughs> Yeah, no, so you had to be like five foot six or something. And I was like five foot one and a half. So, um, yeah, but no, I hadn't really, I hadn't really sang. I hadn't really thought about singing as something I wanted to do. Yeah. And I, and, and, orig and originally I did it as more of a distraction, yeah. you know. So I found the singing teacher and she was, um, she was an opera singer actually. And I hadn't really wanted to sing opera. It's just that she was local. She was affordable. She was round the corner. And I went to her and she was she she was great. You know, she was um, a French woman retired in her 60s. And her husband, Giorgio, was um, a retired Italian opera singer. In fact, he'd been quite famous. But at this point in her life, he was there to make the tea and biscuits and take your coat. And she was there on the piano. Her name was Nadine de Barry. You know, she was all like, oh, she had been a star in Paris, you know. So um, she was there on the piano in the conservatory. And she was she was so lovely to me. She knew that my marriage was breaking down. She knew that I was having, she, I don't think I told her about the, the childless part at that point. You know, this was in my kind of, I was about 27, 28. Um, but she was lovely. She used to sit there and listen to me 
give me tea and biscuits and then she used to say a prayer for me oh. before we'd start our lesson yeah and you know what she she really she really connected with me and um I felt like I had someone taking care of me a little bit you know mm. and I'm sure like my mother would be mortified to hear that actually because but but it was true it was very you know how many women and I don't actually think she had children herself yeah not that I asked her but um yeah, so I went to her for a couple of years. For the first year, she wouldn't even let me sing a song. I only did scales. Oh, wow. And then, yeah, and then the second year, I started getting into, you know, singing the songs I wanted. You know, it's all like, midnight, not a sound from the pit. It was all that stuff. And then it was all, uh, you know, and then I started singing some jazzy stuff. And she'd say, Elaine, you have a voice for jazz, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was great. And then I uh, joined a band, auditioned for a band, oh. uh, for a back in Fine. Hmm? How old were you by this point? I was 30, hang on, yeah, so I had my miscarriage when I was about 31, 31. So, yeah, 30 or 31, 31 maybe. Um, yeah, so I auditioned for the band as a backing singer and I actually got the lead singer, which was like, I was terrified about that as well. But that was a great experience. Yeah. So I did that for a few years. And then one of the girls in the band, she said to me, oh, she was a great girl. She said to me, I'm going to do uh, a jazz and gospel course at Goldsmiths University. Do you want to come? So it was a part-time course. And um, I just thought, yeah, why not? You know, I wasn't really into gospel, but I like jazz. Yeah. And uh, I was, I, I really, I really, I'm a rhythm singer, really. I'm an improviser, really. That's kind of my thing. So I went with her and that really solidified what singing could do for me right. within my body. Yeah. That was the moment. And that was the moment where I truly, truly felt connected with myself at the deepest level. Had you and singing intentionally, feeling that it would be something that could offer healing, could offer you know, solace for you? Or was it something that actually you, you stumbled across after you'd been singing for a while, then actually you started to really become aware of what was yeah it was it was after a while because in the beginning all you're thinking is i'm trying to get better i'm trying to be a better singer so you're putting the work in you know and then you reach a level when you think oh actually you know i can hold a tune my breath is stronger i can do this and i can do that but there's a lot of this there's, there's a lot of sides to performance there's this kind of side mm -hmm. you know and then there's this deep kind of spiritual side they don't often mix you know if you looked at i mean whitney houston was big back then if you look at her she's kind of a mix of, she has those two. If you look at a lot of the soul singers, they have this deep soul. But you think, well, I'm not a black singer. I probably won't be able to do that. You know, it, so th there was it was very kind of divided. You know, you were very kind of put in a box according to what you look like. But this was a time of, you know, that music had really been mixing over the last couple of decades, and the singers were starting to mix as well. So um, when I went to gospel, it was very kind of hand on your heart close your eyes, sing, don't worry about how you sound, just sing very quietly, hum if you want to, you know, and it was, it, it was, it was, it was a body, it was an embodied experience, and I can, yeah, I can remember one day, we were all there on a Saturday morning, and uh, there was about 20 of us, and we had to hold hands, and we had to sing this song, it was very emotional, it was very simple, very, kind of like the charm, you came to my charm, very like that, and then we had to, and honestly, by the end of it, people were in tears mm -hmm. about a quarter of the people just kind of didn't come back the next week because so they couldn't cope with it. Some people just went out to the toilet straight away. And I remember getting the tube from New Cross because I lived in Harrow at the time across the other side of London. And it was a Saturday afternoon. I stopped in Trafalgar Square and I just got myself some lunch and I sat for the rest of the afternoon in Trafalgar Square feeling enlightened, mm -hmm. feeling connected. I felt this massive weight lift from me and I, the tears were just coming and I just sat there with my Tesco's lunch of sandwiches, just sitting there in the sunshine and I knew, and I'll never forget that. You know, there's certain times in your life where you know, that's a pivotal time in my life. Yeah. And I knew that the power of singing, and I knew that the power of my voice was, I don't want to say healing me, but it was nurturing me. It was giving me something. It was a place I could go. It was more than a place I could go. It was something I could be. And uh, 
Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was really, really important. And I, you know, I've met singers that have never been to that place. Yeah. And I've met people who don't really sing that have been to that place. So it's not necessarily that you're going to, it's a very revealing, vulnerable place. Yeah. But my God, my God, when we're dealing with childlessness, how much more vulnerable can we be? I mean, you know, we've, you've, you've nowhere to go. You may as well. I've been praying. I've been doing astrology. I've been looking. I've been, I can't tell you how many books I've read. You know, so many different things, you know. So, yeah. And I just thought to myself, do you know what? This is my voice. It's mine and mine alone. No one can take this from me. They might have taken my chance to have a child, but no one can take this from me. Sorry, Tara, are you okay? Yeah, no, I just got goosebumps. No. The duration of this is my voice. I was, yeah, just yeah, so powerful, that statement. So powerful. And, and remember, at this stage, I wasn't even talking to anyone about childlessness, yeah. but I felt that I'd reclaimed something of myself, of my, of, of, of my you know, I hadn't, I hadn't been battling. I, you know, I'd been putting up so many barriers. I was angry. I was frightened. I was angry. I was very angry, actually. But I couldn't show it. I was very angry. The fact that my voice had been suppressed. I was very angry that no one was listening to me. I was at, well, I wasn't saying it either. I was very angry that no one understood. I was very angry at things that people were saying to me. Oh, you want to oh, hurry up? You know, you haven't got a lot. All the, you know, oh, you haven't got kids. Oh, didn't you want them then? You know, all the, I, was, I was so angry. I was so angry about all of it. And I felt this is my safe place. And also when I was singing, I felt like I had a sense of empowerment. And that was when I was started singing in front of people. And I realized the power that that gave me. It was like a new identity for me. Yeah. So it was it's just the way it went for me, you know. And everybody has their journey and you've you've uncovered so many of the things talking about that sort of that your voice reclaiming, angry, frightened. But in your opinion, what do you believe is one of the most often over things or aspects of this journey of being childless but not by choice? The most overlooked aspects in what in terms of the voice or just in terms of just generally? Just generally. I, in your generally, I, um, I, you know, hey, listen, I don't expect we're all on our own journey. We all have our own story. We all have our own feelings, you know, ours, our, they're, they're all different. And then people that aren't childless, they obviously have their own stories as well. I don't expect someone to know exactly how I feel. But what I do think is lacking is a lot of respect for the struggle we go through. And, you know, I'm not asking someone to sit there and cry buckets of tears with me. That's not what I want. I don't want pity. But I think at this point, when there have been so many amazing women writing so many amazing books, I mean, I didn't discover Jodie Day till I was 46, right. not 2013. And when I heard her speak, I was like, oh, my God, thank God, finally, 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 someone is out there. You know, because I didn't have the skills to do that. I'm a singer. You know, the most I could think about was say, well, let's go and sit in a church hall and all past the Gary Baldy and maybe no one will speak a word. You know, I couldn't imagine what could be done. So I thought there are people out there. It needs journalists. It needs writers. It needs people with these skill sets. You know, people that understand media to get out there and to spread the word. And so when I when I joined Gateway Women, that was uh, that was that was just pivotal and that was that was overwhelming as well because suddenly i was with loads and loads of other women who were in the, in the who were childless with their own stories you know and to be honest with you none of us knew we were grieving until jody said guess what girls this is grief and suddenly it was like the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle just slotted in and i could see it all and i'm like this is it this is the answer I've been looking for. Now I can make sense of it. Now I can understand it. Because when you don't see the foundation of your story in a solid explanation, you're falling down all the time. You can't lift yourself up. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. Oh, again, just absolutely spoke to every cell in my body there. Wow. You know, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. I mean... I kind of think I'm a bit kind of like hardcore now. You know, I'm 54 and, you know, this has been 
my life's experience. You know, I've got children all around me. All my first cousins have children. My sisters have children. There's only one person that I can think of that's kind of close in my lineage that doesn't, and that was my grandmother's sister. And she was like, she was amazing, actually. I thought, but everyone knew, every, no one knew why, you know, and, and she kind of had this kind of glamorous life. She was married to a chauffeur and everything. And she, I kind of held her as kind of a beacon of hope, but I know that she was extremely sad. And when I, when I, really kind of like started talking to other women about it I did get quite angry again you know I'm a bit of a you know I'm the woman that wants to wants us all to stand on Tower Bridge and walk down the South Bank with a banner in our hands going listen I have a bit of respect for what I've been through you don't know how many you know there's a woman there there's do you know there's three women in your life that you currently know that are going through this and you have no idea mm. you know so the thing is, I think it's so hard for women to speak out and it's not surprising that they're suppressed. They're completely invalidated. Um, you know, their stories are not given space. And when they are, they're so terribly painful that people don't know how to respond. They panic, they say the wrong thing or they say nothing. Yeah. And this is all about education, isn't it? So we need education. I, I'm saying, yeah, we don't get the respect. But it's because they don't understand. There isn't the education. Up until 10 years ago, there's been no narrative at all, you know. Yeah. And I have to say as well, the, the one of the good things to come out of lockdown is the fact that, I mean, we the childless community is connected so much more online. We wouldn't have met otherwise. Yeah. And that's where it's so powerful, I think, the role of social media. And I know I've definitely witnessed the community gathering a stronger voice absolutely of of lockdown and i think world child nurse week happening in september and the the sort of gathering of energy and voices that happened with that was really for me you know observing from the sidelines it felt really powerful it felt like there was a, a momentum coming behind the voice behind the movement and then you know keeping in connection through instagram you can watch people from afar you can get as involved as you feel comfortable and I think this is what's so important about the role that social media can play is that there's some real great opportunity to to start to inquire but from the sidelines in a space that can feel very safe in a space that feels Absolutely. you've got some control that you've got some um, say in how deep you go and, and how and when you expose yourself to certain conversations but then also you get to see people's faces, you get to learn a little bit more about them. You know, people will be watching this, they will be connecting with you and they will get to hear them more about, um, about the support that you offer. And, and that then makes it just that little bit safer that when women feel ready to, that they then know where to go. And you know, book conversation that happened today, there was a woman who was asking for like who do people follow she hadn't found anybody and she was asking for certain organizations to go and follow or certain groups to go and follow because she was feeling really quite lost and I just thought how beautiful that she can then now have yeah. directions to be um to be signposted and guided and not experiencing sadly what you experienced and I know Jodie Day also makes reference to that the, yeah. the nothingness that was around at the time and yeah it's, it's it's like it's like it's like some it's like suddenly you're on the inside you're on the sorry you're on the outside looking in it's like i've written a few things down here because when i when i heard your questions i thought what can i write down yeah is there anything else i've put here yeah, it's yeah you're just you're not it's not even you don't even get to the point of dismissal yeah it's not like you get a chance to say anything and it's like it just doesn't exist and how do you start so i didn't have language i didn't know what to say plus i was so young as well yeah right. you know um i used to i wouldn't want to go back there again and what really gets me now is i would hate to think that there's any young girl this is kind of my little bit of it as well as well as the singing and you know helping all childless women i mean the fact that, you know, I don't want there to be any young girl feeling alone. And I know that they will feel alone, even if I say this to them, because, you know, they might not have a partner or they might not be able to talk to their parents or they might not have uh, their own parents there or they might not be able to talk to their friends or they might feel as though their life's already difficult as it is or they might be scared or they might feel they're making too much fuss, you know. I don't, and, and it's more and more, Tara, it's more and more we're seeing, you know, young girls coming through now with all sorts of conditions when they're young. 
it's you know i'm so glad that this i mean they're braver because they've got this online space they don't know what it is to be without this online space so who knows where it will, will, will go you know i mean i'm part of the last generation that will know what that isolation truly truly is um and i did feel ashamed i really did feel ashamed but as soon as i understood when i got older and as soon as i got my boys and as, and uh, in my in my thirties and then in my forties when I became part of Gateway, I didn't feel ashamed. I felt angry still. <laughs> it's a lot of anger. You know, I need to do this chanting for my anger, and I don't know that it's anger now. It's more. There's work to be done. There's stuff to be done, and you know, there's we need to constantly give ourselves support because this is not going away in any one of our lives. Or in any of the lives to come. So we're not just talking about societal uh, understanding. We're now talking about how we can manage our lives so that we can be at peace, yeah. so that we can carry on, so that we can wake up in the morning and think, Do you know what? I'm going to have a good today. I'm having a good day today. I can remember when I started singing. You know what? When I um, there was a moment when I really got into singing and I knew that I was having lessons and everything. So I'd go home and I'd sing more. And I think, oh, before I was singing on karaoke, but now I'm having singing lessons. This makes it like a real thing, you know. And I, I can remember I start to get, started to get excited. Mm. I had not been excited for years. And I just thought, my God, I'm excited. And then when it went further than that in years to come when I was performing and I lived in India for a long time, I used to do a lot of, a lot of bands on the beach and stuff like that. And then a lot of kind of, Five star hotel jazz and evening, all that stuff. But when I, I used to, I used to feel joyous at times, mm. and singing has always done that for me. It's always taken me to that place. And 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 the other thing as well is it helps you on the inside of your body. Yeah. It's such a subliminal kind of like action that happens, but you're actually putting subtle vibration through your body. Mm. You're helping to tone your vagus nerve. Yeah. You know, you're triggering your parasympathetic system. You're bringing in your rest and digest and revive and your support and the healing. Your whole body is relaxing. You're able to sleep at night. It's, it's kind of like a workout, but it's kind of internal, which is um, why really I wanted to kind of package that and bring it into the childless community. I mean, when I joined Gateway, um, Jodie said to me, oh, you're a singer. Fantastic. We can have a choir. I was like, whoa, hang on a minute. I'm just, <laughs> I've just got it. <laughs> and like, um, you know, thinking about like seven years later, I thought I've really got to do something. So um, in 2018, I wrote a song for World Childless Week. Um, that was so difficult because I thought I could have written a song years ago about this subject, but I didn't. I didn't want to be that childless singer, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be that person. And um, but I thought I've got to do it. And it was extremely therapeutic. Again, it's like it's not like you do one thing and you're okay. You're never okay. You're constantly finding ways to dig deeper, to sit with yourself, to allow this pain to come through, to allow yourself to go. Do you know what? I'm going to be all right. It's okay. It's okay. And all the time that you're doing that. You're building up strength within you. You don't even realize you're doing it. And then when suddenly something hits you, because it does now and again, eventually you're like, whoa, that just hit me. I'm just going to lie down. I'm going to do what I do. And I'm going to feel bad for the rest of the day and probably tomorrow, maybe even the day after. But after that, I'll get it back again. Yeah. And you come to see the pattern and you come to see how it is. And I just want to say for anyone listening out there who's in, deep early grief and you know for for all women if they're in, it does get it, it gets less difficult to deal with i don't want to say it gets easier there's nothing easy um it gets less difficult as time goes by but i've had a lot of years you know and i feel like i'm a survivor now i feel like i'm i, I feel like i'm a survivor of my childless situation you know yeah so and I really hear as well the duration of this journey. You know, like I said at the start, this isn't a week long. This is, this can be a lifetime journey. And this, with all the different layers that goes on. And so I am so deeply grateful for you having shared your journey and being so open and honest, because I know that that's something that can also be really 
can be really difficult to be that open. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sharing. Oh, you're welcome, Tara. You're welcome anytime. Yeah. Seriously, I mean, it's taken me a long time to kind of like say these things in public as well you know it, it, it isn't easy for me to just to come out and say I mean I am a performer there is that you know so I could kind of like flick over a little bit you know but it's it is what it is and I refuse to be taken down by it I refuse to have my life taken by this situation you know I've got I've got more to give and I've got more to offer and I've got more happy moments to have yeah. you know and as, as much as our pain changes and the way we change we change within our roles. Like I said, I've had different lives. I spent time living in Asia. You know, I, be, I became a singer. Now I'm doing this, uh, the Childless Voices singing, and we're doing the Sunday chanting circle. And there's been lots of other things that I've done. You know, I've done some writing, all, all sorts of things. Not necessarily around this, but there's lots of different things I've done, different relationships, times when I've been on my own. I'm on my own at the moment. I'm really happy for the first time in my life to be on my own as a childless woman, mm -hmm. I don't feel demeaned, dismissed. I don't, if anything, I feel like, whoa, bring it on. I really do, you know, and um, yeah, I really do. And I'm so grateful for all the other women, you know, like Steph at World Childless Week, she, you know, um, we're actually, I'm actually making a, a podcast with uh, um, Chiara Berardelli, who is another. Uh, singer songwriter she wrote an album about her childlessness and uh, we interviewed Steph actually um, not long ago so that's something that's going to come out soon again and and I, I just feel like this there's, there's a lot to be done and so many people are doing it you know Jodie's doing her work Katie's doing her work Tara you're doing your work now you've got so much to offer you know so much with your understanding and it's amazing how we can bring it's like what have we learned in this life what have we found out how are we going to package this up and give it out there and say, here you are. This is my offering. Here is my creation. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like, you know, you can't get into your body enough as far as I'm concerned because that's what strengthens you. And your body, I, I put a post up about it the other day. It just came to me and I thought, do you know what? Your body is carrying you through this hell at times. You know, support it a bit. Be a bit kind to it as much as you can. You know, and do what you can. And there's so many women. There's so many reasons for childlessness. So so many people with chronic illness as well. That's that's something that's really opened my eyes doing this work. Because I've we have women coming to the childless voices singing sessions and the chant who would not be able to get out of the house to come. You know, um, I mean, I just something I never even considered. So I feel that more makes more. There is more of us coming, and as you said, one in five women is a lot. Definitely. So, and what I would love for you to do, you've shared about, um, you've mentioned about the chanting circle. Would you like to share a little bit more about the online spaces that you are offering women to be able to join you? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, we, our healing voice, I wanted to do something with a healing voice before I considered doing it. For childless women mm. this is something that's kind of been in my heart a long time back because i know how my voice has got me through and i understand how it works within the body and um it started with the singing it started with childless voices so we had uh just before the pandemic hit we had one physical session and i had 15 16 women in a room and we all sang and it was great and it was all singing and so we've been doing so after the pandemic hit Reluctantly, I put that online and it took a bit, little while to get it going. But now we have twice a week, and it's been going for a year and a half now, Childless Voices singing sessions. So that is every Saturday at 11 o'clock for 90 minutes and every Tuesday evening at half past seven for 90 minutes. And, you know, the classes vary. Sometimes we have four people. Sometimes we have eight people. They're very small, and I want them to be small as well. Mm -hmm. And the sound is muted, so I can't hear them. <laughs> sometimes they can unmute and do a solo, only if they want to. But basically, I thought, how am I going to do this? This online choir thing that you see, it's all editing. It's all mixing. It's all done in the studio. It's not real. Everyone, it's not real. It's not real. It's very hard. Or if you can have a setup, it's really complicated. Mm. But I thought what I can do is help them to be a diva in their own living room. So we've done some amazing songs. Yeah. So we just have fun. Um, and we're having a picnic in London next week. 
hopefully, uh, you know, no, nothing changes. As yet, we can't sing in public, um, even though football fans can go and scream their heads off. Anyway, let's not go there. Um, pick my love. But, yeah, when, it's, it's, sorry? When is the picnic and where is it? Oh, the picnic is in Hampstead Heath on Saturday, the 10th of July. And if anyone is thinking about coming sing it, coming to singing or wants to wants to try it, just get in get in touch with me. I mean, I have women coming from all over, all over uh, the UK and also um, actually one woman in Canada. She's actually coming over. Do you know, actually, Tara, I must say, we've got an official study happening. Yes. For Charles' voice is singing. I'm quite, I'm, quite, I'm quite blown away by it, actually. It's um, I like a proper, proper study. You know, it's like suddenly, my God, it's going to be in academia. I mean, I'm just like, whoa! You've got. To... I didn't even get. My... I didn't even get an O level, Tara. <laughs> and so... <laughs> so, who's running the study? When's that happening? So this is happening in September. Uh, this is Laura Curtis, and she's in Canada, and she's flying over to. Um, York, York, York University to conduct um, some studies about female hormones and the female voice. Wow. And she's done a, a number of studies already and she had been through fertility treatment and she decided that there was no study done on the effect of the female, female voice while they were going through fertility treatment. Right. So she's got, she's got proper backing. This is 100% official stuff. She's part of our Childless Voices Singers, Childless Voices Choir, I just say singers. And she's coming over and she's also got, she's also doing a study about us. Wow. And it's going to be great. It's going to be a 10 month study. So she's just going to be speaking to some of the singers. It's not going to affect, I mean, it's like if you join the singing groups, it's not going to affect anyone that doesn't want to be in the study. Yeah. It, it's all very, you know, um, um, yeah, you don't have to give your name, all that kind of stuff. God, I'm falling over my words now. I never glass all the time. <laughs> Tara, I need a gin. <laughs> well, you... yeah. So that's 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 all happening. That's all happening. Um, but yeah, just that's all happening. And uh, so yeah, the singing is great fun. Yeah, made a lot of friends, and people have made friends outside of singing as well. So that's lovely. And just coming together, you know. And we don't speak a lot about our childlessness but we all know that in the middle of singing no one's going to pipe up and talk about little johnny at football and there's something really comforting about that isn't there because we all need our sanctuaries we all need our spaces that we can go to where we can feel safe, yeah. feel nourished and this is such a beautiful offering that offers that opportunity and like you say there's no there's not going to be any fear or concern of somebody coming in and starting to talk about little johnny and not that that doesn't have a place it really really does but sometimes we need yeah but not in childless voices it doesn't <laughs> you know we want to give support you know and it's also the thing someone said to me also you know when are you breaking up for the summer and i'm like what are you talking about this is childless voices we are not operating to a school timetable yeah. The whole point of it is, you know, it's just the way, you know, it's just what we expect, isn't it? We're so indoctrinated yeah. with the nine to five, the school timetable, what you should be watching on a Wednesday, what you should be watching on a Saturday night, what clothes you're going to wear, what you should be listening to. You don't realise how powerful the society is that we live in. As, you know, as you said, we're so, we're just in it. We're just in it. Yeah. So that's one that's one thing we're doing. So that's the childless voices side. And then um at the beginning of lockdown, well not at the beginning of lockdown, it was the second lockdown. When was the second lockdown? November? It was November, wasn't it? Do you remember we locked down? But yeah. I just started doing the chanting circle and I really wanted something um I do well I know you're a yoga teacher, right? So I I I've, I've been doing yoga I didn't do so much in the lockdown, but I've been doing yoga for eight years. I had a hysterectomy. Ladies, go to yoga if you've had a hysterectomy. Take it really easy. Oh, my God. It, it gave me my strength back, so I had no strength afterwards. Um, and also, having lived in India, I knew the power of yoga. I'd been to lots of, like, kirtans and chants, and it's all very, you know, it's all in Hindi or in, you know, or, or else it's connected to the Buddhist language or the Hindu religion. But I wanted something that was um, for everybody. So I wanted something that bridged the gap between singing mm -hmm. and religious chanting. And I wanted to create something that was just having the same effect in terms of being easy on the body. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, 
as a singer, I've done a lot of jazz, but I've done, I mean, I'm a real improviser. You know, I, I'm this kind of singer that you put something on or a band starts playing and I'm off. I don't need to learn, don't ask me to learn the words. I'm rubbish at that. I just want to make it up as I go along. So I thought, okay, let's, let's, let's do something like that. So yeah, we started off and I did it through Gateway. Thank you, Gateway Women. Thank you, Joe Today. Thank you, Karen Enfield. Thank you, all of you girls that came for six weeks for free because it was locked down and we really bonded. And it was kind of very much, you know, I am that I am. It was all this kind of stuff. And then I wrote some more chants. I wrote one to the tune Scarborough Fair about these women brave, but they're all very kind of like a couple of lines very relaxed, some of it's call and response. Again, everyone is muted. Everyone's there with their candles, sitting there. You know, a lot of people come, do yoga. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, you know, so you can see. I mean, I've got people that come to the singing sessions that would never come to the chanting. Mm -hmm. And I've got people that come to the chanting that would never come to the singing. And then I've got people that overlap. You know, I've seen a few of them on here this evening, actually. And I must say, Tara, thank you so much for coming the other week. Oh, it's beautiful. It was so nice to have you at the chant. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's such a beautiful space that you hold. So warm and inviting. And again, that's part of your gift is your warmth of helping to make people feel really comfortable. Because, you know, for some like me, I was not blessed. I was only blessed with a voice that sounds good in a shower or when I'm drunk. <laughs> I'm not sure that's not true. <laughs> Actually, you know, really getting into the body, like you say, and really opening up after so long of where we can hold so much in our chests and, and, and really push stuff down. Push the breath down to the pelvic area. It was just fun. And yes, there is a reason why we're there as in all part of the childless community. But actually, it's an opportunity to sing. It's an opportunity to be with other women. It's an opportunity to laugh. It's an opportunity to belt out a track if that's what you want to do. It's an opportunity to lose yourself in a chant. It's all of those opportunities. And yes, we might have yeah. being together under that banner, but actually it's about having an opportunity to use your voice and express yourself and you go as deep into that as you feel called to on that evening and that's really really powerful so um yeah thank you for the space that you so wonderfully held oh I, you know and the thing is as well i thought i've got to do this every week now so we have it every sunday Brilliant. and um it's just lovely because people know they can dip in and out so you know, if you're interested in trying the chant, you're welcome to come for a taster. I always let everyone have one taster on the chant. Um, you know, and then you can either subscribe, which means that you get invited every week. And it really works out, like, I think, about the price of a, a frothy coffee, a cappuccino, if you come every week. And, um, you know, or else you can just come whenever you like. And also, if you come to the Chanter's Voices, you get a discount on the chant. So, I mean, it's not like some major business things is not it but the thing is also for me as well being uh being a singer is i lost i lost i lost all my income when uh yeah. when covid hit yeah, yeah. so it was like it was kind of this combination of things happening together i didn't sit out thinking 20 years ago i know what i want to do i'm going to start off a childless voice <laughs> session but as things were happening i was thinking wow and I, you know what, honestly, Tara, I've got so much out of it myself. I've learned so many things. You know, I mean, the girls that come, I'm just so touched by their bravery. And you know what, they support me as well. Because I think they know me well enough to know that I'm a bit all over the place at times. You know, I'm a bit, oh my God, you know, we had a bit of a disaster yesterday. It's like, it's for some reason, my speaker wasn't working. You know, like, oh God, you know, so it's not, it's just really, it's just meeting really nice women. I've met in the childless community some of the most amazing women in my, that I've ever met in my life. I mean, that's not saying I've met amazing women in other places I have, especially like traveling, you know, and friends that I've had way back, like from school days and that, you know. But um, seriously, and, and when other women say to me, friends of mine say, oh, it's so hard to meet new friends, isn't it? When you get older, I think, well, I'm meeting loads of people. <laughs> oh. So, you know, and oh, we're all ch we're all childless, but you know what? It gets to the point when you get into your friendship that that doesn't. You know what it's like, Tara. You're not. It's not. It stops being the main focus. Obviously, we're talking about it here today. Yeah. But 
when you meet people and you're with them, it's just like, yeah, whatever, you know. Hang on with One you. of my, actually, I must just tell you quickly, and I don't even know if she's still watching. I know she was watching earlier. I won't name her, but she, um, she wasn't feeling great. And I said to her, oh, you need to get away. Why don't you come to London? <laughs> you can come and stay with me. I thought, oh, she'd never, she, she'd never say yes. She's like, yeah, all right, then I'll come. <laughs> she came a couple of weeks ago. Oh, my God. She, she came three nights. We had a blast. We had an absolute blast and i just thought this is amazing this is just amazing you know so we're like we're like you know we're like close friends now but That's the in terms of the power of the voice and what it can do i will just say that i've had um uh, we've got a i've got a website it's not a brilliant website it's one page and it's not like a click and collect thing so there's no good going on there going right i'm going to join that now click and i'm in yeah. it doesn't work like that because i can't afford to have i can't afford to have it open like that what if some strange guy just wanders in and suddenly he's on the screen so everyone that comes to Charles voices and everyone that comes to the sunday chanting circle comes through me and so um a, a lot of them come through gateway women yeah. um and you know there's a place there in the members market now where they advertise uh women that are offering all sorts of things be it meditation chant um art uh, yoga, all sorts of things, and then there's so many other women offering so many things. You're offering, you know, your yoga. I know Tara. You know, I want to support our community, and I kind of think, you know, like how the gay community invented the pink pound. Well, it didn't invent it; it just happened. And people start talking about the pink pound. I was just sort of thinking, well, we need, we need a currency. Uh, let, let's not have a conversation about what what that might be called um, right now. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I want to support women who um, I want to I want to support women who are childless who are working with the childless community. You know, I want to if I'm going to pay someone something, I want to pay a woman who's like me, who's who's really putting her all out there because none of us do this lightly. You know, no. it it it's our lives, it's our hearts, it's our souls and our beings and our identities. Um, and also, I don't want to be, I don't know about you, I don't want to spend my whole life crying in a cup of coffee. You know, I mean, I, I, no. I have a great time. You know, I, I've had a great, I can't complain. Honestly, if I drop dead tomorrow, I can't say I haven't lived. No. I've really lived. I'm you know? conscious that I think Instagram Live cuts us off after an hour and we're just coming up to it, my love. So To think that I was worried about not having anything to say. I mean, honestly, I can talk for England. <laughs> You've, you've spoken so wonderfully and I know that just you sharing your story will be incredible and then the space that you are offering will also be incredible. So how do people get in contact with you if they are, have listened to this evening and thought, yes, I really want to come along to Circle or connect with you? How do people connect with you? Well, I'm on Instagram under Our Healing Voice and um, if you can't get me there, my Facebook page is not... I don't know what it is. I don't know. It's not, you know, any, but, but you can contact me there. My name is Helen Louise Jones. Look, to put, put bluntly, you'll find me. Google me. My singing, my other singing stuff is up there, even though I'm not performing at the moment. But you, my name is Helen Louise Jones. Google me. You'll find me somehow. Um, email me is the best thing, though. Our Healing Voice yeah. at gmail.com. Our Healing Voice at gmail.com. Um, yeah, you'll find me. You'll find me. Um, and, you know, and if you do come to sing, what happens is we always have a private Zoom first. You don't just land in the middle of everyone. And also for anyone who's coming for the first time to a group of childless women, I know it's really daunting sometimes. You know, um, you know, we'll have a chat first, don't worry. You know, don't worry. I'm, I'm there for you, you know. Uh -oh. And uh, we're in this together, Tara. Always. We're in it together always always and um yeah just the last comment that's come in thank you both for the chat really appreciate everything you do for the childless community helen and i uh totally 100 percent echo that in terms of whether it be have a conversation with you or come to the circle or however you are interacting with people you bring such warmth and such energy and such vibrance as well as huge heart and massive compassion and empathy for where women are at. And just, you know, from my own personal experience in the, the few times that we've spoken, just feel like I've got a real champion cheerleader in you, you know, of just somebody who goes, yeah, 
totally that's absolutely you're on point with everywhere you are you're at and that cheerleading energy of just you got it girl and that's really really powerful to be reminded of that 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 inner strength so and yeah so from my heart to yours i thank you so much for this evening's conversation it's been beautiful to connect with you and for you to share your story and for sharing your offerings and i look forward to connecting with you again real soon thank you tara so much yeah and somebody's letter to my soul helen is definitely a cheerleader for all of us yeah. Oh, 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 I know who that is. Thank you. Thank you. So will I be able to see all the chats? I'll be able to see it, won't I? Um, I don't know whether they stay up. Um, oh, no. There's some. Um... Because I haven't seen it. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm so, I'm so glad. Because I don't know. I couldn't see who came because the chat comes over my face and then disappears up the page. <laughs> <laughs> okay. ladies thank you for all of those that came and listened and um so after what? tara what's going on <laughs> oh i love a bit of drama tara <laughs> <laughs> we made Do you know what tara, tara that is like my life my little interview wouldn't have been complete <laughs> without that i can tell you are you okay yeah yeah it was just the phone it was just the phone there <laughs> Took a and i will tell you the story about how I fell off a stage in an evening dress in the middle of singing a jazz tune. And I learned again, it was, it was an only fools and horse moment. <laughs> Another time. <laughs> I love that. Maybe we'll do part two. Maybe we'll do a conversation over. And, uh, over alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Oh, so much love from my heart to yours. Wishing you a beautiful evening ladies for who joined us this evening and uh for joining in and joining us it's been beautiful to have you here and so much again from my heart to yours thank you for being on this journey take care bye take care bye